Uh, my name is Sharon Maxwell Magnus, and I am the head of the media group at the University of Hertfordshire. The media group consists of three different subjects. Uh, they are film, journalism, and media, which in itself is divided into media cultures, theoretical media, if you like, and digital media, which involves uh, really gaining digital media skills, using software, um, gaining visual skills, video skills, podcasting skills, um, those sorts of practical hands-on area. In all of our courses, whether they're journalism, film or media, we, uh, one of the unique things about us is the blend of skills that you get, the theoretical and the practical, in order to make uh, students, our students very employable. We're also, and this is new since Charlotte's Day, we also have a strong international and diverse focus because we now have franchises in Malaysia and Egypt, as well as the opportunity through Zoom and other means to connect uh, all over the world. So our students are now beginning to connect with students, particularly in Egypt and Malaysia, but also in other areas. And indeed, uh, to study on modules again new since Charlotte's Day, such as international reporting, which have a really international focus. Um, another great thing to say for our current students to announce is that uh, shortly several of our media courses will be joining the Public Relations and Communications Association, PRCA, which is the biggest of um, and of these associations, uh, one very prestigious, and it will be partnering with us, which will allow our courses to be recognized as PRCA partner courses, um, which has international and national value, also allowing us to uh, have more speakers of the caliber of Charlotte to join us and more opportunities for our student to network, find internships, all those sort of areas. Similarly, we'll also be joining the British Society of Magazine Editors for those who, like myself, uh, were magazine journalists before and who, who have a passion for magazine journalism, which happens to be my area of speciality. So that's a little bit about us and our courses. Our courses also, um, we also have courses that combine with creative writing, one of the su uh, subjects that uh, Charlotte studied along with media and journalism and English literature while she was here. So we're able to combine with areas such as creative writing and linguistics as well. And we offer a really diverse range of courses, everything from single honors in um, media to combine journalism and media, media, mass communications, which contains four, uh, four different areas um, and so on. So today, um, it's a very special day for me because uh, Charlotte Jones is not only someone who's made a terrific success of her professional life as a global content editor and now a life coach, uh, it's quite moving for me. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to start crying. Um, because she was one of my students. And um, I think what's special about Charlotte is that she was, uh, had all the same preoccupations, concerns and anxieties as other students. Uh, the module I took her for, the portfolio journalism module, still going strong, including an element of work experience, which I think you took up at Bauer and where you later worked. And uh, the things I remember about Charlotte and I still remember most of my students um, very much so. But I remember that Charlotte was a hard worker and that's really important. You are only gonna get out what you put in. She was a very hard worker. She was very committed. Importantly, she was someone who asked questions. And I think that's really important in making the most of your degree to know when to ask for help and to ask for help frequently. It's a good thing, not a negative. Um, she was someone I remember meeting briefly in the first year when I felt uh, the confident person you became by the third year was very different from the person you were in the first year. Obviously in the first year, there's a lot of focus on friendships and getting to know people, but we also find that students perhaps sometimes like confidence, confidence in themselves, confidence in the communication skills they're gaining. 
perhaps lacking in confidence that they'll find the community for them. And that's why we stress confidence, communication, and community as the three things that we try to do with students. And certainly by your final year, you are so much more confident and so much more skilled. And I wasn't surprised when you were one of the students we were finding had got a job very quickly after university because of the effort, the commitment, and really the wish to do it that you put in. So a bit more to tell you about Charlotte. Charlotte is now a global content editor and she'll talk about what that means, but global again, a very important keyword in media at the moment. Uh, she creates digital content for some of the world's most prestigious uh, brands, particularly specializing in beauty, which is a massive industry. So L'Oreal, uh, for instance, is one of them that you've worked for is one of the major players in the beauty industry. Um, you've also been a journalist to start and, and really honed your skills. And you're now working as global content editor for Revolution. But being someone who's always up for a challenge, always up keen to do something new, I notice, and this is very important to us today, that you have trained as a life coach. And again, for Charlotte, that doesn't surprise me because Charlotte was always a very generous classmate, always someone that people went to. I seem to remember in your group work for advice and guidance and how you brought on some of the less confident members of your group. So again, that doesn't surprise me. So today, Charlotte will be talking uh, uh, three major areas really about her own career and the opportunities in media now, because uh, that's very important. Uh, there tends to be for understandable reasons, a lot of negativity around, but I think Charlotte will help you dispel that. And she'll also be talking very important again in a pandemic about resilience in the media and resilience for life, which comes out of her own um, work as a life coach. And at that point, I'd like to say we'll be, Charlotte be talking about half an hour. There'll be an opportunity for questions in the chat, which I will monitor. I will put myself on mute and that's enough from me. And um, we aim to finish around 1.45-ish, 10 to, 10 to 2. So without any further ado, I will mute myself and hand over to Charlotte. Charlotte, it's lovely to see you. Can't wait to hear from you. Thank you, Sharon. And hello, everyone. Hope you're all well. That was a very generous um, and very lovely introduction, actually, Sharon. And actually, when I was pulling together my career timeline uh, for this presentation, it's it's actually quite incredible. Um, you know, I, I will say this confidently and what I've achieved since my degree, um, which we'll go a little bit more into. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So we'll talk through kind of a presentation now. Um, so, and I'm just going to put on present mode. Okay, before we get going, I want to start by asking you a few questions yourself. Have you ever experienced heartbreak? Have you ever been bullied? Have you ever had relationship issues? Have you ever experienced some family issues that you've had to overcome? Have you ever dealt with loss? Have you ever lost a job or had issues within that job? Have you ever had to cope with mental health issues or somebody else with mental health close to you? Have you ever had a miscarriage? Have you ever had to deal with someone committing suicide? Um, and the reason why I ask these questions is because if you're here and you've experienced one or more of those, then you have experienced, you know, resilience. And if you're here and you've bounced back, then you understand resilience too. So I just wanted to, to, to tell you, I just want to ask you the, those questions. Um, because it's something that we're going to be discussing in this presentation is how to build your resilience, especially within the media um, and for your career. So what we're going to discuss in this presentation is just a bit of an introduction to myself. I mean, Sharon done already an amazing job of that. Um, so I don't think I need to go, go too much into detail. Um, and then, you know, enough about me. What about you and your career? Um, we'll be doing a little exercise there as well. 
Um, just kind of going through my career timeline and how my university degree has helped me within my career. Um, top tips to prepare you for your career now, what you can be doing now to kind of prepare you for when you do come out and want a, a degree in, the, in a career in the media. Um, why resilience is important within the media and how do we actually build resilience? So who am I? I'm Charlotte Jonesy on Instagram. Um, Sharon has already discussed, uh, given me an amazing introduction. So I'm just going to move my bar because it's just across there. Um, oh God. And um, I graduated from university with a 2-1 in humanity. So I studied English literature, journalism, media cultures and creative writing. Um, and as Sharon said, I currently work as a global content editor. And what that is, is I create for 56 countries around the world, I create all the content and all the communications uh, material for uh, the brand, um, which is Makeup Revolution. It's one of the fastest growing brands in the UK, in the beauty, in the beauty sphere and in the private sector. Um, I Previously was at L'Oreal, also working on social and content, um, but we will go more into that. I now work as um, kind of balancing that with my life coaching, kind of helping people break through barriers, negative self-belief um, and challenges in life so that they can live the most fulfilling life that they want to now. Um, and I also am um, just recently a new mum, so eight weeks in, so <laughs> juggling quite a lot at the moment. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I actually want to do a bit of an exercise. Um, so for just one minute, if you could just write down what you want to get from this session, um, and we'll discuss this at the end. Okay, hopefully you wrote down what you want to get from this session. Um, moving on to another exercise, and you've got two minutes for this one. Um, this is a really powerful thing to do. Um, and this is visualizing the career that you want. You may not know what you want. So where in two years time, think about where would you like to be? Would that be locally? Would that be in London? Would that be working from home? Would that be in an office? What does that look like? Um, are you in front of a computer screen? Are you in front of a microphone? Um, are, you, are you typing? Are you working for an online publication? Visualize it. Um, really think about what you want and write that down. You've got two minutes. Hi, Charlotte. Just uh, to keep you updated on the chat, we've got um, an insight uh, from Heidi into what looking for wanting from today. Someone who works in the industry does on a daily basis as part of their job to okay. better inform media students. And someone else who's really keen to learn about your own journey, uh, she felt in the media. Great. Um, we'll be going through that in a little bit more detail and on the daily basis, I'll, I'll touch more on that when we go into the career timeline. And also tips on what life is was like at university and what a global editor does. So again, pretty. Oh, 
Sharon, you cut out then. Sorry, um, and tips on what life is like at university, which um, may have changed a bit at the moment with uh, the environment we're in, uh, but generally, and what a global content editor actually does. Okay. So, great. Okay, you've got 30 more seconds until we move on. Okay, and that's two minutes up. Hopefully you were able to write down something um, that you kind of visualize in what you want. Um, it's a really powerful thing that we do in life coaching. Um, so my career timeline, I graduated in 2012 um, and this was actually in the recession. So similarly to kind of COVID-19, it future felt very bleak at this point. Um, but I had been doing quite a lot of experience, uh, work experience and working for free um, that then did land me a job. Um, actually, my dream job, which was working for More magazine, um, which was a fashion and beauty assistant at the time. Um, I was blogging for More magazine online and obviously blogging was a really new concept um, in digital at this time. And I was doing it for free, but it gave me amazing experience so it allowed me to interview people it allowed me to work on print and digital at the time um, it also gave me kind of different skill sets on working um, uh, with different writing skills um, so I landed my job in more magazine which only lasted for six months before the magazine actually closed down it literally happened overnight um, we were called into the office, uh, told that the publication won't be no more the following day um, and printing had to stop instantly. At that point, I thought, oh, what do I do? Is magazine journalism the way forward? Um, or, you know, how can I future proof myself? Um, because it felt like at the time, you know, magazines were you know, folding and they do continue to fold and they are moving online. Um, well, as we know, 2020, they are, you know, majority online and doing really successfully very well. Um, so I, after More Magazine, I then interned around Grazia, Heat and Closer. Um, I also did a stint uh, on Kiss 100, you know, interning there. And I just put myself out there. I completely, you know, I worked on cupboard floors. Um, you know, doing fashion returns, you know, I don't condone that, by the way, but, you know, it was kind of, I'll do anything just to get in the media. Um, and there is a saying within the media, once you're in, you're in. Um, and I do think this is very true. Whatever sector you end up going into, you tend to kind of move around that sector. So people, you know, you it becomes a very small industry. So I work in the beauty industry, previously in the fashion industry as well. And you, you do know a lot of people um, within that sphere, it becomes very small. Anyway, um, moving on, I decided that, you know, I wasn't just going to keep freelancing and interning for nothing. Um, so I was looking into other areas that I could go into that I could use my university skills for um, my degree. And I moved into PR, um, which is something that I never imagined myself moving into. But I thought, actually, it's very similar to journalism in the sense you still use your writing skills, you write press releases, but it's more about, um, you know, how you can, you know, um, excel a brand and, you know, how you can um, kind of uh, work, work with a brand and how you can help their brand identity. So I moved into working for a smaller agency and this was on one of the bigger brands, Nivea. Um, and 
I, I loved this job. I only worked here for a year um, and moved up very quickly to an executive. Um, and I worked in kind of the PR and social media space. I then decided it was time to move on to a bigger agency. So this is a PR agency looking after um, lots of really big household brand names. And I moved into working on the Unilever accounts. Um, so Tony and Guy, Dove, Tresemme and BO5. At this time, I was kind of working a little bit more in the digital space um, until I realized there was an opportunity within the agency to actually set up a digital social and influencer marketing team. And at this point, influencer marketing was a very new concept. Brands didn't really understand social media. So I thought it was definitely a service that we could offer as a, as a business. Um, so I set up that division along with um, the CEO of the company and this did very, very well. Um, and I worked on campaigns for Simple, Christian Louboutin, um, Indeed Labs, Dr. Hauschka, um, St. Ives, there's so many different brands. So L'Oreal actually poached me at this point um, to come over and do the same, but instead of agency to do this in-house. Um, so I looked after all of the content and social for L'Oreal Paris across all of their divisions. Um, and then, you know, two, two and a half years later, I then moved on to Revolution Beauty. I now work as the global content editor. And one of the questions was, what do we actually do? So day to day, what my job would look like is I would, um, first of all, see, see what's going on in the space, um, you know, what brands are doing, make sure that I'm on top of, you know, what brands are, are where, you know, what brands are doing with influencers, what they're doing with content creation, what campaigns they're working on, is there one that we need to be aware of? And then, you know, kind of sharing those insights within the team. Um, I then, I will be creating content for, so this is social media content. This is content to sit on our newsletters, our websites, our, um, our distributors, our retailers. So we sell in 56 different countries, but what does that content look like for say Superdrug? What does that content look for? Um, you know, in Turkey, in Spain, in, so we will, you know, create that content and kind of distribute it out to the different markets and then they will localize it. Um, so we will create the content, mostly with a digital lens rather than a print or in-store lens, um, but that does come part of it. It's a whole 360. Um, we will also create all of the communications so all of the written content so that's from the product copy that you'll see on the website that's press releases and um, when we're doing a campaign and um, that'll be headlines that you might see on the websites again the di distributors and the retailers um, that will also be uh, uh, kind of the product descriptions on the website um, any kind of written material or any visual or audio, everything comes through the content team um, and we do all of the editing. So everything that is put out into those, um, those countries, is, it all comes from the global HQ um, in London. Well, working from home as of 2020. Um, I hope that answers the question a little bit more. Um, and in 2020, I also qualified as a life coach, kind of helping people to break down barriers um, and help them kind of live the life that they also want to achieve. So moving on, how did my degree actually help my career? So it opened the doors to a wide range of careers, as you can see from journalism, PR, marketing, communications, copywriting, production and content. It also helped me understand media law. So law and ethics really important within journalism and PR. It also gave me a wide variety of skills, including writing, reporting, researching, interviewing, filming, editing, audio, content management, 
website design and Photoshop. Um, it also gave me the importance of storytelling, which in marketing is one of the key things that we, we always work to. What is the story behind the campaign? Also time management and deadlines. Um, a career in the media is definitely fast paced and uh, it's not your usual nine to five job. So it definitely taught me that. Um, it also taught me how to hook a consumer within the first line, which I think has been invaluable with my career in press releases that I've written in my journalism days. Um, and, you know, what I write now, you know, how to hook the consumer, like how do we sell that product? How do we relate it to the consumer straight away? Moving on to top tips to prepare you for your career now. I, I just wanted to point this um this quote out by Marie Forleo. So the key to success is to start before you are ready. Something that if you're like me and you're a perfectionist, you you tend to procrastinate and you wait until you've absolutely got everything perfect. But, you know, start before you're ready. That's definitely one of the biggest tips um, that I could give you. You know, don't wait until until you are ready, you know, start now. Um, one of the biggest things is get experience now. Don't wait until you graduate. Write for a student publication um, or the podcast or radio or find a placement for an online title to write for, even, it's, it, even if it's for free. So something I did myself was um, I blogged for More Magazine, but I also asked to write for online publications, um, you know, for free. And I built up my portfolio by doing that. Um, so that's one of the biggest things that you could be doing right now. Have an online presence that showcases your digital skills. So, you know, whether you've got an Instagram or a TikTok or a blog or a podcast, employers really want to see what you've been doing. Like they really want to see your passion points. Um, and by having an online presence that really helps you um, and sets you apart from others. So something, I, you know, I'm an employer myself and that's definitely something that we look for. Gone are the days where, um, you know, you don't look at someone's online presence anymore, you know, that you do look at their blog or their Instagram and actually, you know, if it showcases your editing skills or your written uh, communication or it showcases how, you know, what beautiful content that you can shoot, then that's definitely something that um, employers look for. Sign up to industry newsletters. So the, whether it be the drum, marketing week, campaign live, keep on top with what's going on. Again, what employers look for is they, they look for fresh ideas, people who understand the, the space and the landscape. So keeping up to date with industry news is really important. Um, follow social influencers and brand campaigns. So being in the know is what sets you apart from others. Also keeping up to date with competitor landscapes. So whatever sector you want to go into, what are the brands? What I would do is actually write down the brands that you would like to work for, the agencies that you'd like to work for. And then who is it that, who is it that their competitors are? Keep up to date with what they're doing as well connect with people and develop relationships in the area that you want to get into. So again, I've done this myself and you know some of the best opportunities have come from personal relationships with you know someone that I've met through a talk or someone that I've met through um, you know through doing some work work experience. Um, that's really invaluable to preparing you for, you for your career now. And then when you're given an opportunity, go above and beyond. A job in the media, as I said before, is rarely nine to five. So if an employer can see that, you know, you really are passionate about making this, you know, a really good job. And Sh Sharon mentioned earlier how, you know, it's really important, you know, how hard working I was. It's because I really was passionate about getting into the media. And when uh, an employer can see that, um, they, you know, they, they can see, we're not saying, you know, burn yourself out because that's not important. It's important to look after your mental health as well. Um, but do go above and beyond and show that you really are passionate about this area. 
um, and have a voice. Some of the best campaigns have come from just speaking up in a meeting um, or, you know, speaking up on social media. What What is it that, don't be afraid to, to vocalise something that you're passionate about. Um, like I said, some of the best campaigns have come from just an idea that's, you know, popped up in my head and I've just shared it within you know the work environment and you know we've kind of ran with that campaign and then we've built on that through brainstorming as well um so just moving on to kind of why we need resilience in the media career i love this quote by nelson mandela do not judge me by my success judge me by how many times i fell down and got back up again and another really powerful quote is persistence and resilience only come from having been given the chance to work through difficult problems. So the digital world is ever evolving um, and the pressure, the pace and the demands on people are increasing. Um, you know, it's there's a mentality certainly within the brand I work is it's extremely fast paced. Um, and, you know, if they don't do it now, someone else will. So we have to write, you know, copy within 30 minutes at times. We might have to come up with a brand campaign idea because a product's come in earlier than it was expected to. And we might have to literally launch that next week. That's how fast paced we're working. So resilience really is important to help us to cope with that kind of work stress. Um, deal with barriers that arise, bounce back from criticism from managers and deal with internal and external business pressures. If we have resilience in the media, we can recover quite quickly from difficulties and then we can keep going as well. And like myself, many employers in the media look for graduates with resilience. Why? Because they have problem solving skills, they adapt to change, they understand they can um, do well in a fast pa paced environment uh, they can work longer hours they're prepared to take on anything that is thrown at them there is a you know a sink or swim mentality and I don't want you to see that as a, a negative um, because actually if you thrive within within that environment which I certainly do it's actually really exciting um, and Job hunting in itself requires resilience, um, especially in the media. As I mentioned before, I received quite a lot of um, rejection, uh, you, know, you know, starting out in a, um, in a recession. I know we're in a pandemic now, so that might kind of give you a little bit of hope and motivation that actually you can, you, you know, you've got to keep going. And even when you do get those setbacks or rejections, you have to keep going and you will get a break. So how do we actually build resilience? So be prepared to fail um, or have setbacks. Kind of, you know, there is a saying in life, shit happens. Um, and if you're prepared for that shit to happen, then you're, you know, you're, you can easily kind of move forward and actually just get back on the horse and try again. Um, a lot of people, who are resilient understand this um, so it's just kind of you know, life isn't that kind of shiny Instagram perfect so things happen and you will have you know failures but also they can be your greatest success um, you know in the future be positive um, as humans we're generally you know we <laughs> something in life coaching that we learn is that evolutionary we always kind of focus on the negatives rather than the positives it actually takes a lot more energy and effort to be positive than it does to be negative um, because of the way that we are conditioned um, but resilient people know how to kind of take the pos positives out of the negatives so when problems and situations arise um, you know you really need to change that negative state of mind to you know positive affirmations and you know I am I will I I can be I can do this you know and it's okay to kind of feel a little bit down in the dumps when something happens um, but equally you need to kind of tw 
turn those negative thoughts into positive ones quite quickly. Um, changing your mindset can really be um, amazing for you know your career and how, how you deal with situations when they arise. Um, believe in yourself. I mean, this is really important because you know, believe, believing in yourself it kind of goes back to your purpose, like who you are. Um, you know, remembering what skill set you, that you have to offer in the media. Um, you know, don't be disheartened when someone says you don't have enough experience or um, you know you don't have. Um, a particular skill set that we are looking for you know believe in yourself and what you do have to offer and it, that will work in your favor you know it comes with as Sharon you know said confidence having confidence in yourself um, will definitely set you up for a resilient future um, and support so you know who who champions your goal who are your biggest um people you know your biggest supporters um you know there are also resources for support so that is filling your mind with supportive content so that is youtube videos like ted talks um that is podcasts that's listening to people's success stories you know keep yourself positive and focused when um kind of getting into the media um, and that will really help you in, 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 in doing so. Um, so just kind of, just touching upon this quote here is, what seems overwhelming now will be your testimony, testimony later. So after listening to this chat, what steps can you take today to start your journey? You've got two minutes to kind of write this down. Okay, that two minutes up. Okay, I think we can move on to question time, Sharon. Um, you are ready for whatever life throws at you. Uh, you can follow me at Charlotte Jonesy as well. Um, and thank you very much. Great. Um, I think at this point, um, maybe I'll, uh, if we stop sharing the screen, and yeah. um, I've put in the chat for any questions. One thing um, you've described your um, time in the uh, typical day in the media, but I think to add to that, what I'd like to say uh, to those who've joined us is that um, 
from what I hear from my own career in the media, from students, former students' career in the media, the three things that I think you can take out is that all careers are very, very different, but then all the careers that I've come across involve some form of communication across several platforms. It's not enough to be skilled in just one area, but to be able to communicate perhaps online in print or online digital or so, a video or whatever. Um, they all involve creativity, communication, and I think time pressure, which you alluded to, uh, Charlotte, I think that's, um, it would be very rare to find a media career where you had the time you would like to do what you would like. There's a, quite a lot of, uh, it's fast pace, it's continually changing. There's no typical day for a typical day in the media, um, but they that unifies them. The combination, I think, of time, thinking about it, creativity, um, time pressure and communication. So at this point, it'd be lovely to get questions uh, from Charlotte. You might want more detail about her, her days or about how you can make your start. Um, she certainly brought up some interesting things in terms of getting your presence out there online and bringing in getting work experience. Um, that's very important. So I've got a good uh, questions coming in here. Um, someone who said that they, she told her said, I tend to be perfectionist myself and I tend to wait till I'm sure. I know it holds me back. I think I might take the leap more often. Really good idea. Yes, the uh, perfect is the enemy of the good. A very good idea to, to follow Charlotte's advice. Were there any other courses that you think are worth doing on top of a college or degree course? Did you do any extra for your CV? That's come on. Did you do anything professional accreditation as, as well? I think that's coming out. Um, no, I didn't, but I think experience is very important. Um, I, I did touch upon this in the presentation. Definitely, you know, writing for publications, just getting as much experience as possible, or that's, you know, setting up your own blog or your own um, content, you know, even just to share with an employer that you know how to write social media copy or whatever area you want to go into. Um, that's really, really um what we look for rather than you know additional qualifications on top of your degree um i definitely think you need to yeah just put yourself out there show what you're capable of um and whether that is kind of written content or audio or uh, you know, content creation, video, whatever it is, definitely, you know, you can share that with an employer and that's more credible, I think, in the media. Great. We've got uh, two questions from Kadria and Alicia, who essentially are asking something similar, how to stand out within a crowded industry like media and journalism and getting a good graduate job within the media, especially as it's so crowded. So those are very similar thoughts. Yes. How do you make yourself stand out from the crowd passion i think that's the main thing um, when you've got passion for what area you want to get into and you that really comes across in interviews um you know you're more likely to take someone on with passion because you feel that they are going to give their all to what what the job is um and you know you don't necessarily have to have a huge amount of experience with that if you've got that passion for what you want to do. Um, how to stand out, I think this again goes back to kind of sharing what you're capable of, um, you know, what your skill sets are. If, you, if you're amazing at video editing, then really share that stuff. Um, you know, I've taken people on um, just based on what they can provide and they may not be great at written content, but their skill set is in another area within the media. Um, so as an example, one of the girls we took on recently actually is amazing in Photoshop. And that's what we needed as a business. We needed someone who could just quickly, you know, create content on Photoshop. And that's what we took her on. But that's what she brought to the table in her interviews. Um, and again, it goes back to passion as well. She was super passionate about that area and she self-taught her you know, she taught herself how to do this as well. 
Another lovely question here uh, from Kadria. What advice would you give to your younger self and indeed to other <laughs> as aspiring students? So. Not to worry as much. Um, you know, it does come with, uh, similarly, we said this earlier on, you know, this is a pandemic. I graduated in a recession. I worried so much about getting into the industry and whether I was going to, and I, I, I cried a lot of tears as well um, and was very upset over lots of rejection. But I wish that I just said to myself, be more confident, be, I, you know, I mentioned it in the presentation, you know, be confident with your skill set, know who you are as a person um and you know kind of bring that to the table when you're looking for a job in the media um, and be yourself as well that's something that i definitely learned very early on um in my career in in my job in l'oreal um i remember pre presenting you have to excuse me as well i probably do have a little bit of a baby brain at the moment I haven't been haven't been in work mode for about two months, you know, I'm on maternity leave at the moment. Um, but usually, you know, when you're presenting, I remember trying to be someone else, trying to be someone different presenting. And the best advice that my boss gave to me at the time was be yourself. Don't try to be someone else because people will actually love you for who you are. And you don't have to be perfect when you're presenting either. People just want to listen to, you know, someone who, has experience in that area or they just want to listen to a normal person um, which why you know speaking of different media mediums um, which is why podcasts are so popular um, which is why YouTube is so popular people just want to listen so that's probably one of the best pieces of advice that I was given to, to myself that I wish I told myself when I was younger. <laughs> I can see we've been joined by Genevieve, who's the tutor for our MA uh, course and is the course coordinator. Um, so I'm going to just take two questions. And Genevieve, I know as a fellow uh, PR expert, you'll have a question that you'll want to ask uh, Charlotte. So just two more and then over to Genevieve. Um, Sarah, uh, we've got what motivated you to want to work with the uh, media industry. And what kind of salary could I expect working in the area of digital content creation? Oh, that's someone who could be a journalist, not afraid to ask a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, motivated. Uh, I knew that I wanted to be a journalist, definitely. Um, I didn't know that I wanted to go into PR or into content creation or editing or any of the other careers that I've had. Um, so I would say the motivation came from journalism and actually my passion to, to write. I love writing. I love creating content. So, you know, if you're doing something that you absolutely love, then it doesn't feel like you're actually working, a, you know, a super hard job because you're very passionate about it. Um, and salary, ooh, <laughs> salary wise, let me just think about this one. Um, it can range from an assistant level. Uh, you're looking at probably a London, uh, I'm talking a London salary here, around 22 to 23K. Um, that's generally what our assistants are on. Uh, managers can range from 30K to 50K. It really depends on your level of experience um, and what brands that you're working for as well. Um, and then, you know, if you move up to senior manager or director, you're kind of looking at more of the 60K plus band. Great. We've got two more um, from Sarah. Which campaign are you most proud of? And why? And from Jane, what would you consider the most challenging crisis situation you handled? And how did you handle it? Two more great questions. Amazing questions. Um, best campaign and it won an award actually, well several awards, um, was actually True Match by L'Oreal. Um, so this was something that we had never seen in um, advertising or marketing before um, and it was something I remember sitting in the boardroom and people just looking at me like are you being serious? <laughs> um, so you know it was about for the first time ever we had shades that could match darker skin tones. 
Um, and, you know, this um, was, I mean, it shouldn't have been, but this was a new concept within the beauty industry. Um, you know, people with darker skin tones weren't able to get their shades in store. So for the first time, um, you know, this was a, a new concept. And how do we how do we portray that? So um, I wanted to work with all different types of people um, that hadn't been seen in, in advertising or the media before, especially within beauty. So we worked with really small YouTubers um, who are now big YouTubers, actually. Um, people like Gary Thompson, who is um, a, a black man, a gay man, a creator. Um, we also worked with Katie Piper. Um, we also worked with, I mean, Cheryl. Um, there was, you know, the first woman with a hijab in there. There was also someone who had a disability. Um, and it was just about portraying, um, you know, people from all different walks of life all over the UK. And what started as a, a small social campaign actually became the biggest global campaign um, that L'Oreal had done. Um, and it was a bold move for a brand that was so rigid for previously um, in their advertising. I'm sure you, you all know L'Oreal very well um, with their kind of airbrushed images um, and their you know, their perfect kind of video content. Um, so this was kind of bringing it back down to, you know, real life and people's stories behind Just Makeup. Um, and similarly, something I, I did last year with Revolution is one of the, um, one of my favorite campaigns is called Makeup for, Men Makeup for Mental Health cam campaign, you know, talking about how makeup can actually help people's mental health and really give them the confidence to be who they want to be. Um, so I'd say those are the, my two favorite campaigns. Great. Uh, Genevieve, I'd like to put you on the spot if I may, and just ask if you've got a question you'd like to ask Charlotte on probably on behalf of some of our MA students. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think it's similar to what Jane was asking. Hi Charlotte, sorry we came in okay. late because we were doing, um, a crisis communication course. So it's similar to that because Jane was saying, um, what's, what's the most challenging crisis situation? And I was thinking, um, have you handled challenging partners or clients and how did, how did that go? How did that work for you? Um, certainly in my PR days, we've had challenging uh, clients, especially with different brands wanting different things. Um, and if you're on agency side you know the the clients on the in-house side will you know from the brand side will think that they know best when you have an expertise in a certain area um so it's actually I think the best thing I could say is it's being it's educating your clients on certain areas so saying that oh we do yeah, we agree with this, but how about looking at it like this? Um, and that's the best way I've found around challenging clients. Um, you will have times where you just have to go, okay, let's do it your way. And then sometimes, you know, it doesn't quite work out. And then you can go, well, told you so, but <laughs> not in that way. You won't say told you so. And you kind of just have to smile through it as well. Um, uh, something maybe not on the brand side, um, an in-house situation. So that was um, the campaign that I just mentioned actually did have the opposite effect as well. Um, so we, for the first time ever, we put a transgender person in the campaign um, and it kind of backfired on us because of previous history. And that was probably the, the biggest crisis management that I've ever had to deal with um, because our bosses in Paris, um, you know, had to deal with this crisis on a global scale. Um, it got picked up in the media and it kind of went everywhere um, in terms of what, you know, you know uh, what they had said. The thing is, L'Oreal chose to drop this person um, you know, quite quickly because of the 
communication issues at the time um, and because of what was said. So, you know, there was plenty of discussions, conversations on how we deal with this um, and how we communicate as a brand. And it was challenging, but definitely one that I've learned from. Um, and something that came from that experience is just knowing who you're putting in campaigns and making sure that you've done kind of a history check or, you know, a bit of a background check on on who that person is. Um, but I do work for a brand now that kind of just takes on people with all walks of life, even if they do have, you know, uh, a history of, of something. Um, you know, everyone can make mistakes on social media, um, as long as they're not huge mistakes from like a political or, you know, religious or anything of that nature. Um, then obviously we have to take that into consideration. But I would say that's from a crisis management point of view, that was um, a huge one. <laughs> Thank you, that's helpful. And Sharon just put in the chat, because you mentioned agency and in-house, uh, which, which would you prefer to work with? Would you prefer in-house or agency? You experience um, what's better, if there's a better? They definitely bring different experiences and I would actually say try to do both um, and it's something that I was told as well to have agency experience coming from the other side then to working you know in-house on the brand side you get it from both points of view um, and we work with agencies as well in-house so I actually understand what they're dealing with so it, it really helps kind of the relationship as well um, so if you can do both, but I personally prefer in-house and working for the brand because you have more autonomy, you have more control. Whereas um, when you're working on agency side, you're kind of, um, you know, you are taking direction from the brand. And as, as I said previously, you are having to educate them quite a lot, but in um, you have to be mindful of how you do that. And there's a certain way that you have to deal with different clients and different brands yeah that's helpful thank you i've checked this some more questions here i have got some more questions uh here all on social media content um how important is it for students to be thinking about their social media content uh eg things they might regret when potential employers are looking and also from um that's from Sarah, some Sveta, we've got, do you encourage students to have an Instagram page to put out their own content while they're pursuing, say, a master's course? Um, so again, really, this is on social media profile and how much you put out there, I think. Um, I think if you want to showcase your skill set and it becomes more of a portfolio, I would say set up a separate account um, from your personal one. It depends what you're posting on your personal one. Um, if you're posting, you know, your family walk with your dog um, and, you know, your shopping trip that you've, you've done, then, you know, that's kind of, it's personal to you and to kind of your friends and family and doesn't actually showcase what you do have to offer other, other than your personality, which of course is equally as important. Um, but, I do think that making sure that whatever you're posting, you do need to think, okay, am I happy for my potential employer to also see this? Um, you know, I, I see my, my profile as an asset to companies. And I will always say that because, um, you know, it showcases me as a person, what I stand for, my values and beliefs. Um, it also you know it shows that I can build a community an audience I know how to interact with social media I know how to create content I know how to write captions so as long as you've got a kind of valid answer or a a reason for particular posts to share you know if you're happy with your employer to see that then there's nothing wrong with that the best um you know candidates that we've employed have had the best social media profiles they've actually shown what they can do um, and it's become almost an extension of their portfolio um, so maybe just think about that when you're when you're 
posting or you know you're about to set up another account I think hopefully that answers your question and I think we've got time for one more and there is one more from Kadra at Kadri based on your personal experience do you consider working as a freelancer challenging or is, is it something you consider as if someone wants to work as a freelancer as a failure certainly not a failure uh, definitely, definitely not. I mean, we take on freelancers to help us um, in house because we have so much copywriting to do, especially around bigger campaigns like Halloween or Christmas, um, where there's a huge amount of copy to write. Or we might be launching 60 SKUs, so that's 60 products, and we don't have enough resource within the team to actually sit there and write. Or um, we take on freelance uh, content creators as well. So th those are people that come into the studio and they create social media content only, or they might do um, lives for us, or they might just be doing something for YouTube for a particular campaign. So it's definitely not a failure. It's actually an asset to have a freelancer, but based on personal experience, um, to begin with, it's challenging because you don't have the the right connections or the relationships to keep your freelancing going I found it really challenging at the beginning because I didn't have that so I've done freelance work um, since then and because I have the connections I have the people that I can go to and say look I'm you know freelancing for a bit um, if you've got any work let me know and then all of a sudden work starts coming in and that person recommends you to someone else um, and I may kind of touched upon it in the presentation is that whatever sector you work in it, it becomes a very small world you tend to get to know a lot of people and um, so you know having those connections and those relationships if you are a freelancer is definitely invaluable. Great. I think it's now running past two. We have a short networking session on another Zoom link for some of you, which we'll just have in, in about two, three minutes. Um, I'd like to thank on behalf of everyone, Charlotte, for a really both inspiring and accessible and engaging talk. Um, I can see from that, you know, you're both expert and really someone who's really thought about what you do. Um, you fulfill that potential you had as a student. And it's fantastic that you're willing to come back only eight weeks after you've had a baby, spend this time talking to us all and giving another generation of students the inspiration that you once enjoyed. So on behalf of myself and indeed Genevieve, I would like to thank you and say goodbye. Thanks thank a lot. Thanks, much. Charlotte. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who've joined us. More information on the University of Hertfordshire and its media courses can be found on our website. And anyone in the sixth form, we also have open days, which are also being posted uh, there. So just look for the University of Hertfordshire website. You'll also see all our Media Matters talks uh, previously, because this is a regular series and they'll be on there as well. So thanks to you all. Thanks to current students for joining us. Thanks to uh, Sixth Form for joining us. Thanks Genevieve and thanks you most of all, Charlotte. Thank you.